Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. I kind of came across this dynamic where if you kind of think, just generally speaking, we were managing portfolios that had 20% or so on average allocated to the broadly speaking alternative investments. I I found anecdotally that they accounted for typically about 80% of the questions that would come up from clients and about 80% of the the pain points that advisors were dealing with. So I felt that there's a really telling opportunity where I, I think you know, it, it's well documented some of the longer term challenges that traditional types of portfolios are going to be facing in the kind of decades ahead. Uh, and so, you know, ways to address that involve incorporating other types of diversifying asset classes and investment strategies into a broadly diversified portfolio. And the challenges have been around the experience of doing so and the comfort level and confidence that uh, many advisors have in communicating and explaining these uh, strategies to clients and getting them to actually stick with them uh, over time it was a challenge as well. Um, just inherently a bit more complex. All right, happy November, everyone. I am not rocking the Movember mustache every year I want to and then chicken out. Uh, so maybe next year. But anyway, uh, we have a cage match of a podcast today. We're getting into why that's apropos, but uh, talking with Phil Huber, whose new book, The Allocator's Edge, caught our eye, uh, not so much for the title, but for the subtitle, which is A Modern Guide to Alternative Investments and the Future of Diversification. Uh, so that's right in our wheelhouse listeners and happy to bring on Phil to talk it through. Uh, Phil's Chief Investment Officer for Savant Wealth Management. He's a CFA, a CFP, and lives sort of in Chicago up in the Northwest suburbs. So welcome, Phil. Thanks for coming on. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. I really appreciate it. And thanks for uh, squeezing the uh, wrestling reference into the intro there. <laughs> uh, so Northwest suburbs, which which one? Where are you at? Yeah, so, so despite my uh, Midtown uniform that I'm wearing today, I'm actually located in uh, North, uh, North Chicago suburbs. I, I live in Glenview, uh, but I, I'm working out of our Lincolnshire office today. Nice. And you born and raised this area or what? You went to school? Actually, yeah. Funnily enough, uh, I, the high school I attended is, is like a half mile down the street from the office here. So I, I grew up in this general area. Um, I went to school at Indiana University in Bloomington. So I uh, spent four years at IU and then came back to Chicago, lived in the city for well over a decade. And now we've lived in the Burbs for uh, about three and a half years now. So Love it. what, what happened to Indiana football this year? They were back. They were pretty good last year. Right. And then just went back to reverted to the mean this year. I, I've always been used to the Indiana football program being mediocre to lackluster. So I try not to ever get my hopes up too high. And who's your basketball? Are they going to turn that thing around? Hopefully one of these days. Yeah. I mean, such a storied uh, history for the university. I, unfortunately my attendance there, couldn't have come at the worst possible time. So I, uh, my first year was 03, but that was the year after they went to the 2002 finals um, led by Mike Davis, but it was largely Bobby Knight's kind of recruiting team still. So yeah, they lost to Maryland that year, but then it was sort of a little bit of a steady decline uh, for my four year tenure there. So a lot, a lot of fun going to games, but never quite had a, a real contender for a team. I hear you. Um, so uh get into your background a little bit to call you an author is a little bit unfair, right? I'd say you're a practitioner who's also an author. Um, so give us a little bit of the non author background, if you can culminating in uh, savant there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a first time author. So I probably wouldn't put that as my primary uh, uh, occupation, but it, I'm happy to have that as an additional kind of uh, feather in the cap today. Um, I grew up my whole life around the RA wealth management industry. My, my dad was and is a, a financial advisor. 
he founded an RA back in 1988 called Huber Financial Advisors. Um, I joined there a little bit, at, about a year after graduating college. So I spent a brief cup of coffee as an uh, internal wholesaler for a mutual fund company out of school. Um, but, but by and large, kind of generally knew at some point I'd, I'd enter the, the, the family business and, and always grew up knowing, you know, even if I didn't know necessarily the uh, inner workings of what he did day to day, I always knew that my dad loved his job. Uh, and found a lot of fulfillment in it, so it always seemed like an, an attractive career path to me. Um, but I, you know, I did, I did want to spread my wings a little bit after college, and so um, for, unfortunately for myself, the timing of graduating in, in 2007 and, and about a year into work, we were kind of about to enter the, the teeth of the financial crisis, and being in financial services at a, at a fund company was probably not a great place to be, so I found myself mid-08 looking for a new opportunity, and fortunately, my, my dad was willing to uh, you know, take a bet on me and give me an opportunity. And, and uh, fast forward about 12 years later, I, I spent there until we merged with Savant in uh, March of 2020. So about a year and a half ago. So if I, if, if I think of my tenure at uh, Huber Financial, it was, I kind of came in as, as a utility player, so to speak. Uh, I, I can't even recall exactly what my initial title was. It was basically like, do everything that we need you to do. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a very, very small organization at the time. I think I was the eighth employees. We had a handful of advisors, a couple of client service and operational people, but it was, it was still a relatively small RA, especially by today's standards. I think we had a, a few hundred million under assets when I, when I joined in 08. And so we continued to grow that and build that uh, over time. My role morphed over time to become very much more investment focused. And I realized a few years in that what I, what I didn't want to do was be a full-time client facing advisor. I, I did that for, for a certain portion of my role, but I just was always fascinated and interested in the, the investment side of our business. So, you know, we're very much a planning centric organization. That's what we lead with. That's our value proposition is comprehensive wealth management for clients. Um, but I saw an opportunity to, to add leadership in the investment area, which was largely at the time kind of decision by committee um, and, and everyone kind of pitching in, but nobody really taking ownership of that area. And so I thought that that was something that I would probably do well. And so I, I adapted to that and um, about five, six years ago, became the CIO of Huber and then have, have retained that title and role uh, as, as we transitioned into Savant uh, recently. So it sounds like your golf game just wasn't good enough to be client facing. I don't golf. I'm a, I'm a complete rarity in the wealth management space and that I, I literally never golf. <laughs> I get oh, these no. Yeah. I get invitations all the time to, to go out and play around and I always feel weird declining, but I just never caught the golf club. My dad's a huge golfer. Most of the other folks in the office golf to some degree, but uh, yeah. you know, never caught the bug. And then is your dad still in the, in the biz? He's still there. He's he is. Yeah. 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 Uh, a big part of our, you know, joining forces with Savant was him staying on for at least an extended period of time. But, you know, like many founder RAAs, um, you know, he's in his mid sixties now. He's still got some, some juice left in the tank, but um, you know, it was looking for kind of that glide path of not necessarily a full stop, you know, retirement at some point, but like yeah. how can I transition my career to go back to doing what I love, which, which his, you know, first love in this business, why he got into it was uh, managing relationships with clients and, and, and being around people. And I think the size of our, our firm at Huber before we merged, almost got it, not, not got away from him, but it became larger than he ever anticipated growing it to. It just sort of happened organically over time. And, and, and um, you know, it was never his intention to be managing a 30 person billion and a half dollar operation. It was like, hey, yeah. I, really like, I really like working with clients and helping them with their financial planning and other financial needs. And, and so, uh, but, but wearing the CEO hat, he, he had to, you know, deal with all the other operational you know, burdens and aspects of running a business. And so I think he was very happy to uh, partner with Savant, much like we all were, and, and kind of shed some of those responsibilities and get back to uh, what he d loved doing in the first place and kind of ride out the rest of his career uh, doing that. Yeah, it seems like that's the REA playbook these days, right? Of find, find an older, ready to, you know, retirement is somewhere in the future, not necessarily right the next step, but somewhere out there, merge, bring them in-house. Uh, seems to be the normal play, but, yeah. uh, and let me ask you, sir, as, as an RIA, um, it seems like the old model used to be kind of stock brokerage, right? Of like the advisor has a relationship with the client. The advisor is also the one helping them pick the investments and doing all this stuff. 
And it sounds like, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are more of a top-down approach of, hey, there's CIO, there's a process, we're looking at these investments, and then that's coming out to the clients instead of a single, you know, the good golfer guy is also the guy who's really good at putting portfolios together. Exactly. Yeah. I would, the way I would frame it is we, we have a centralized investment, you know, research department, um, as well as a, a broader investment committee that acts as, as, a, as a decision-making arm for the firm in terms of our, al- our asset allocations, our fund selection, and all of our due diligence, et cetera. Um, and so our advisors across the firm, regardless of which state they're in, which office location they're in, they're tapping into that centralized resource uh, for the portfolios they can offer their clients. And so it sort of takes that responsibility and burden off of their plate, which, which many of them, I, I think, are happy to, to, yeah. to, to relinquish. That's not what they want to be doing is picking funds and building asset allocation models. Um, their, their focus, you know, our advisors, I would say, are very much more the CFP oriented as opposed to the CFA types. Um, whereas we have plenty of CFA types within, within the investment team. And so um, it's, it's good to have a centralized resource like that. So we've got, um, I think, 20-ish or so offices now spread across seven states. Uh, but the investment research team is, is also kind of spread out. We've got myself in the Chicago area. We've got a few analysts in Rockford, which is our head, headquarters, uh, a couple in downtown Chicago. And then uh, our director of research, Gina Beal, uh, she's actually uh, has worked remotely for many years out, out of uh, San Diego. California. Oh, she's the smart one. Yeah, um, she, was, yeah. she was doing remote, remote work before it was cool. Uh, and do you think that's a new model for all RAs or it's already there? It's not even new. Like I, think, I think for larger RAs, that's kind of how the, the playbook runs these days is that you want people focused on their highest and best use. And so for, for those that we have managing client relationships and doing heavy financial planning work, um, you know, not, not, not everybody can be a jack of all trades. And so we have a you know, a number of specialists areas within the firm that we want our advisors to be able to tap into. It's not just investments, it's areas like tax planning and preparation and, and kind of estate planning and wealth strategy. And so we, we've got resources across the various, you know, wealth disciplines within the firm and our advisors are, are kind of more general generalists, but they're a lot closer to the client uh, situation and client experience. And so they can kind of deliver that, uh, you know, end deliverable. Got it. You ever you ever get pushback on the name? Like, let me talk to the savant. Which one of you is the savant? Yeah. That's actually a, a hiring criteria. Everybody at the firm has to be an, an actual savant. <laughs> uh, all right. How do you test that? The uh, Rubik's cube? No, uh, no, we're uh, no. We have, we've got plenty of really really sharp, uh, intelligent people. The name and just really indicative of what we're hoping to to provide, which is you know our, our tagline being wise counsel. Uh, ultimately, that's what we're here to do. Mm. So on to the book, and I want to talk briefly just about the process of writing it, if you're willing. I've got a book that's uh, very similar to this one that's been 10 years in the making and never can get out of uh, like second draft form. But uh, so just tell us, like, what was the impetus? What's the reception been so far? Why did you want to write it? Kind of what- sure. So my, my experience getting the book published might be a, a bit different from most in that um, I didn't really have a book sort of in draft that I was actively writing and then went, went and shopped it out to different publishers. I had been blogging for probably a handful of years or so. I've got a blog called Bips and Pieces. Um, and that was really just a way for, I'd been doing a lot of the content and writing for human financial back when, when I started it. And that was, you know, there, there's a very much a difference in my opinion of writing from the firm, you know, voice and firm point of view, as opposed to the independent individual point of view. And, and, I like the blog idea. There's a few other bloggers I really liked and followed them and enjoyed what they were doing. So I wanted to kind of throw my hat in the ring there. So I just found that to be a really cool creative outlet. And so I enjoyed doing that a lot. From doing that and from having sort of an active social media and Twitter presence, my one or more of my posts got in the hands of, of um, Craig Pierce, who's the editor at Harriman House. And they do a lot of uh, books within our, within our industry. Um, and, and he reached out. This is going back... My, my, 2017 or something like that uh and just was kind of curious hey like you know great to meet you would you ever be interested in doing a book and i was you know very flattered and and but the same and and interested but at the same time like had no idea what i would write a book about i was like oh geez i'm I'm just a a blogger here i don't i don't know the first thing about writing a book and he was like that's okay like let's work together let's you know let's let's go back and forth on some concepts and ideas and see if anything sticks and if, if something does then we can 
we can move forward. And so um, I, I love to be, I, I didn't have any immediate plans at the time, but kind of like you, I've got a, a big bookshelf at home filled with investing and finance yeah. and books. And so I, I, the idea of having, you know, my name on, on my own book one day was a very much a bucket list item that I wanted to, to cross off. And so I was like, you know, why I, I should, this is a great opportunity to have in front of me. I want to take advantage of it. So uh, I, I proposed a couple early ideas and, and those actually didn't, they kind of fell flat with the publisher in terms of like, they just didn't see a book coming out of those. And so it was sort of back to the drawing board and then things got busy kind of life and career wise. Uh, so stepped away from it for a bit. And then we just sort of circled back a year later and we're like, Hey, any, any interest still here? Um, and so the more I thought about it, I was like, okay, like what, what can I, what topic can I write about that? I, a, that I'm, you know, endlessly curious and fascinated by an area that I think I can add value in that I think there's a need for from an education standpoint. And then of course, from the publisher standpoint, something that they think has, you know, any sort of commercial viability to it. So the more I thought about it, the more I just kind of looked inward to like, what are the conversations I'm having internally at our firm with, with the advisors that I support, with the clients that we work with. And I, I can't, I kind of came across this dynamic where if you kind of think, just generally speaking, we were managing portfolios that had 20% or so on average allocated to, to broadly speaking, alternative investments. I, I found anecdotally that they accounted for typically about 80% of the questions that would come up from clients and about 80% of the, the pain points that advisors were realizing. So I felt that there's a really telling opportunity where I, I think, you know, it, it's well documented some of the longer term challenges that traditional types of portfolios are going to be facing in the kind of decades ahead. Uh, and so, you know, ways to address that involve incorporating other types of diversifying asset classes and investment strategies into a broadly diversified portfolio. And the challenges have been around the experience of doing so and the comfort level and confidence that uh, many advisors have in communicating and explaining these uh, strategies to clients and getting them to actually stick with them. Uh, over time it was a challenge as well. Um, just inherently a bit more complex, at least at the um, sort of operational level, maybe not conceptually. Some alternatives are very intuitive and simple uh, uh, conceptually, but it's just the implementation that's quite complex at times. Uh, and then I think it's just, it's again, it's areas that are generally a bit higher cost than the, the you know essentially free kind of beta that you can get for using index funds and ETFs these days. So I think uh, the higher cost, the, the maybe limited liquidity in certain areas, and just the general unfamiliarity of some of these uh, alternatives has kind of, you know, as much as people can recognize the, the, the math staring them in the face of low starting yields on bonds and high equity valuations, not necessarily being a recipe for great perspective forward looking returns, few have kind of stepped off that um, comfort level of, of, a, of a, you know, that kind of canonical 60, 40 type portfolio for a couple of reasons. It's, yeah. it's, it's treated them very well. And so it's become a bit of a security blanket. Why, why mess with a good thing? Why, why fix it if it ain't broke sort of thing? Um, so that's been one area. And I think it's just that, again, with the, the era that we're in, where it's you know, very much the trends towards passive and low cost. Uh, many alternatives are not very <laughs> low cost. And so I think that's you know, another key factor. And so I think, and I think the other challenge has been, I think, you know, Liquid Alts gained a lot of popularity after the global financial crisis of 08-09, uh, very much akin to shutting the barn door, barn door after the horses have already, you know, gotten out of the stable. And so I think, that, you know, it was very much an environment of, okay, we've just seen equity markets collapse and the financial system kind of blow up. Now let's, now, now when things are priced actually attractively for equities, let's go look for ways to hedge tail risk and and add uncorrelated assets. And I, so I think the timing was wrong that um, advisors that kind of dipped their toe in, but perhaps didn't know exactly what they were getting into. Uh, maybe they had a bad experience. Maybe they either set improper expectations themselves or their clients had different interpretations of what to expect from alternatives. And, and it just didn't deliver for what, for, you know, whatever reason. And so I think some advisors were kind of like, you know, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on uh, or shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, and so have, have maybe just been a little bit more skeptical of the space based on a prior experience they might have had. So I think, and I, and I think another element and variable there too was just a lot of product development, just knowing there was a lot of demand for liquid alts. I think a lot of fund companies responded to that by providing the supply and, and perhaps some firms that had no prior experience, you know, uh, offering alternatives to clients. It was just, hey, like there's demand for this, let's roll product out. And, 
there's just a lot of kind of garbage out there and early on. And, you know, not to say there isn't some garbage out there still today, but I think generally speaking, um, the universe of alternatives has gotten a little bit more, you know, skewed towards more higher quality. The, the ones that have delivered well have had staying power. And so I think there's there's less uh, maybe noise out there than there was in those, in those kind of mid 2010 type years. Love it. And we've I've been living that the whole 10 years since, right? So managed futures was one of the huge proponents of that, right? The only thing that was up in 08 and all the liquid alts had managed futures on the cover. You know, our firm was always digging in of like, hold on, this is just on the cover, not necessarily inside the inside the product. Uh, and just quickly, like a bunch of people have been on this pod, a bunch of the names on here, you know, that I read through in the book of Corey Hofstein, Ben Hunt, uh, Meb Faber, like, were they kind of your muses or you, that's some of the, what you mentioned, some of you reading their kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, you, you could say, you know, muses in many ways are just people, you know, really smart people that I know and, and have followed and learned a ton from, like certainly wanted to, to incorporate some of those learnings into the book as well. Some of that was just reflected in the kind of um, editing and fine tuning of the actual draft of the book. And, and it's nice to have friends like Corey and like Meb, who were willing to take a look at earlier drafts and provide their, you know, comments and feedback. That was, you know, very, I think, instrumental in, in getting the book to its ultimate final state uh, and making it better along the way. Like Corey was fantastic. I, I sent, he, he cracks me up. Like I sent him a, a it was a fr- end of the day Friday. I sent him a draft, like, hey, like whenever you have a chance, if you don't mind taking a look at this, I'm like, okay, maybe I'll, I'll hear from him in a, a week or two. And I wake up that Saturday morning, I've got an email from him with, you know, just a volume of, of notes and comments. So he went, you know, he, like many others that, that helped along the way, just kind of went above and beyond. So I think it's, for me, it was awesome to have that kind of, you know, fin twit Rolodex, so to speak, of yeah. you know, just really thoughtful, smart people that were just very willing to lend a helping hand and, uh, and just help me make, make the output as best as it could be. And how'd you get Cliff to write the uh, prelude? So to, uh, to quote uh, Michael Scott quoting Wayne Gretzky, um, <laughs> You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Yep, yep. Um, so I, you know, as I thought about, you know, whether there should or shouldn't be a board, I thought it'd be great to have one in there. And it, I kind of thought about, I could pick one person on this planet to write the forward for this specific book. One hundred percent, it, it would have been Cliff. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, when I think about Cliff and, and maybe AQR more broadly, I, I kind of look at the, the genesis of my interest and in, in fascination with alternatives can kind of be traced back to them. Um, you know, er, in the early 2010s, as they were kind of uh, introducing some of their liquid strategies to financial advisors, um, you know, they, they went a long ways in, in building out educational kind of curriculums and programs for advisors to tap into. And so they had a, a, a event called EQR University that they, you know, have done kind of on an annual basis since then. So I, I went to the first one, but at the time I was very, very new in the industry, still didn't know the first thing about all. So I was going in extremely kind of wet behind the ears and just like an open book. Like, I just want to learn here. And um, and so that I look back at those early AQR universities as kind of my initial introduction to kind of just broadly speaking alternatives and, and the role that they can play in a portfolio. Um, and I've just been a great admirer of Cliff and his team over the years. And then he, you know, he sits on my kind of Mount Rushmore of, uh, you know, investors and someone that he's just been kind of a, a investment hero of mine. So I, I, I knew it would be a long shot, but I kind of threw it out there and, and, you know, for whatever reason he was, he was willing to do it. And I, I thought he did a terrific job on the forward. And so just to have, to have his name attached to this means the, the absolute world to me. So Cliff, if you're yeah. listening, I, I don't know, if I, can, I don't know if I can thank him enough times, but yeah, thank you Cliff. Cause uh, it, it kind of, I think made the whole thing kind of come full circle for me. Right. It's like, he's forgotten more about all this than most of us will ever know. Right. So it's, it's good to have his footprints. He's coming on the pod eventually. We keep we keep working that, but I uh, want to get him on here. You talked a little bit about the problem, so I might skip over some of that. Um, you know, and it's well worn that there's this problem out here: equities at all time valuations, rates at all time lows. Um, what I don't think uh, you had an interesting take that people are all talking about it, but nobody's really doing anything about it, right? The stats tell, stats don't lie. So like, here's where all the money is. Why, if they're everyone's so worried about it, why isn't the money shifted? So you touch briefly on that, but expand on that a little more of what you think is happening there. Yes. I mean, the whole first chapter of the book, I mean, the, the 
title of the chapter is hindsight is 60 40. And all, all the things I, I discuss in there, like I'm not necessarily treading any new terrain there. This is all stuff that's been well written about, well documented that, you know, as, as we know with stocks, you know, very high extreme valuations tend to be, you know, tend to forbear low expected returns over a long period of time. It doesn't really tell you much about the next year or two years, but, you know, you can kind of infer, you know, lower, lower than average returns coming off of high valuations. Similarly for bonds, you know, low, low rates are indicative, you know, your starting yield is likely a good approximation of what you can expect to earn over the next 10 years. And so I, it, it's a rare occurrence to have both you know, the, the really high equity valuations and, and probably speaking more specifically to kind of U.S. centric or U.S. Uh, dominated 60-40 portfolios. I know other parts of the world, maybe not as obscenely, you know, valued today, uh, but, but it's rare to have that that extreme stock valuation alongside, you know, low starting bond yields like we have today. So I think when you blend a 60-40 portfolio together of those two asset classes, you know, you, you reach a pretty, you know, you're kind of in an extreme in terms of, of low perspective forward looking returns. But if you look in the rearview mirror, it's in the opposite. You've actually had a, a 10 plus year period of abnormally high returns relative to average and, and lower volatility relative to historical averages. So it kind of speaks to like, yeah, like it's, it's almost obvious like why people, or why most allocators, I should say, haven't done much about it. Cause like, why bother? Clients are happy, returns have been good. Like, I'm not going to introduce, you know, uh, foreign or different things the portfolio that that I got to then, you know, spend extra time learning about and figure out how to, you know, weave that into my story about how I talk to clients. And so it just kind of like when, when you're, you know, kind of a, if most advisors or allocators are benefiting it or, or evaluating it through a, kind of the cost versus benefit lens, it just might say, seem like, hey, the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze on adding all these, you know, extra components in. Like, I just want to keep it simple. I can do this all at, at rock bottom fees. And so it, it's easy to understand why there's been you know, such an anchoring to this type of 60-40 type portfolio. And, I, and we use 60-40 as very much a, a simple example. It could be 50-50 yeah. or 70-30 or any kind of variation of a, a balance. Do you think that anchoring continues the cycle? And like, you write it, I'm, I almost think like they're all clever by half, right? Like all these people looking at alternatives and doing diversification and they're the underperformers by a large margin. Um, so the other guys, you know, they could say the dumb and Simple approach has outperformed last five, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, if there if there's an investment lesson of the past like handful of years, it's that the, the dumber the, yeah. the investment, <laughs> the better off you've done. Um, right. Tesla so, needs to sell a ten thousand units on Mars this quarter to make their valuation good, but no, buy it, buy it. Um, yeah, it's even even just within traditional portfolios, sort of evidence-based type of ways to sort of improve upon market cap weighting or embed, embed factor tilts or employ geographic uh, diversification. Like those have all been things that have been a, a little bit of a headwind for, for returns versus just own the U.S. or own the largest stocks or, you know, these sorts. So it, it is challenging in that sense and that the, the sort of less data uh, backed and less evidence-based your approach has been, the better off you've probably done. Um, in the, at least in the past few years. So, I, you know, it's understandable why those challenges have been there. Uh, and I think it's good to understand, too, that, that things like starting low yields and things like high valuations, we, we, I think often people look to those as timing signals, like, oh, well, stocks are expensive. It's time to materially reduce my equity exposure or, or get out of the market completely, or I shouldn't own any bonds because yields are low. It's like, no, it's, it's not the, necessarily the takeaway here because we could, we could have looked back as early as the mid 2010s and seeing stocks are looking fairly expensive based on, you know, pick your favorite, favorite valuation multiple or, or rates are already at or near historical low levels. But I think what we've learned is valuations can go higher, yields can continue to grind lower. And so it's, it's less about, Hey, like completely abandon these core building blocks of a portfolio. It's more about just maybe, you know, open up some portfolio real estate for some other diversifying areas that offer uh, the potential for, for uncorrelated return streams or maybe things that can do well uh, at times when traditional you know, stocks or bonds might be suffering. So it's really just about uh, expanding the opportunity set. And then, and I love the one piece in there, which I don't hear that take very often of the 60-40 the combined, the yield of that, which is both the yield of the bond component and the dividend, um, the yield of that is at an all-time low as well, right? So I don't, I don't hear much of that. We hear a lot about everything's super expensive, but 
even if you look at it as a yield play, it's not very attractive. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always you always want to look at things at the aggregate portfolio level, and um, also recognize too, like like relationships between at you know asset classes that we maybe take for granted or that or that we assume are kind of written in stone or, or maybe not so. And so I think everyone's grown accustomed to the last 20, 30 years of of bonds being a great diversifier in equity down markets, but that you know there's been historical precedent of that not being the case. And so I think, you know, inflation is a variable that often we have to, you know, factor in if, if we continue to see, um, you know, materially high, you know, inflation that we've been accustomed to, that could be a negative for both stocks and bonds at the same time and might not offer that, that offset relationship that we've, that we've been used to. And then I think it was Corey about a year ago was putting out, how do you, how does an RA charge 1% fee when their bond, right? If they have 80% of the portfolio in a bond yielding 50 bips or something, right? So there's a little weirdness in that math from an advisor standpoint as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that, that, you know, it's always hard to lump all of the fees that RAs charge directly to the portfolio piece because we, we offer a lot more services uh, to clients beyond just, you know, building a portfolio and trading it and rebalancing it. There's a lot of, of separate from the portfolio um, financial planning work that goes on within not just our organization, but many RAs that, um, you know, if you're charging an AUM based fee, it, it's not, you know, people aren't paying us just for that, you know, portfolio management. Yeah. It's a lot of um, advice, planning. advice and coaching and, and all these other sort of disciplines that are connected to people's financial lives that we're taking a, an active role in. So I, I you know, I think it, it's a, it's an interesting point because yields are so low and so, but at the same time, like, you know, it's not a direct apples to apples. Uh, comparison. Yeah. And I didn't mean to call your out your fees, but like in general, right. Of like pensions endowments have costs. And so there's just at so low levels, you have to seek out other things just to, in order to pay the bills, so to speak. Yeah. 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 And I think yeah, there's, there's plenty of, of, you know, people that go beyond like, 60, 40 tends to be the where people kind of, you know, average into, but like you see plenty of portfolios for really conservative and risk averse investors that are, you know, 70 to 80% fixed income. And that's, that, you know, unless they have, you know, very, you know, if they've already kind of won the game, that's one thing, but, you know, that's just a recipe for negative real returns. So alts, let's talk alts. Okay. Um, Love the conversation of, you know, and I couldn't agree more with your dive into the issues around categorization. It's never been done correctly since the get go, but for some reason we keep kind of pushing these labels on them. Um, so dig in that a little bit. What's an alternative investment for you? Um, what do most people get wrong about that label? Yeah. And, and I, I don't have a perfect solution to the label, you know, either, unfortunately, yeah. the, the challenge is that a couple things. Number one, it's open to interpretation. Um, and two, the definition is always changing. Uh, you know, history has seen plenty of examples of things once sort of viewed as alternative that become over time a little bit more mainstream and commonplace. And, and so that's, you know, to be expected over time. Um, so you'll see, I, I like to highlight examples like, you know, publicly traded REITs and commodities and high yield bonds and emerging markets is kind of you know, more satellite asset classes, but you tend to see them as fairly permanent fixtures of, of a lot of diversified multi-asset, you know, model portfolios that they, they tend not to be viewed through the lens of being an alternative, but in their earlier days, that was very much how they were kind of implemented and adopted was sort of this alternative bucket. Um, so things do have a history of transitioning across kind of that chasm of, of alternative to traditional over time. Uh, the other point is sort of like, you know, in being in the eye of the beholder, um, I, I like to use the example of Bitcoin here. Um, depending on the demographic or age of the person you're talking to, you, you, Bitcoin could be viewed as a highly, you know, speculative alternative, or just like, oh yeah, I trade crypto alongside, you know, stocks in my Robinhood account. So it's like the, yeah. millennial, the millennial Gen Z view of, of, of digital assets might be completely different than their parents or grandparents, and so they're kind of they they might think of it as just it just sits you know sits alongside my stocks and it, is, it might not be an alternative to them because they've kind of grown up with it and around it, uh, where, whereas, you know, other folks might absolutely bucket it as an alternative. So I think that's an interesting example, particularly given the nascency of, of Bitcoin and crypto being 
you know, effectively a teenager relative to things like stocks and bonds, and real estate that we have centuries of, of data on. Um, I feel more of a toddler, but okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah depending on the behavior at times. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think the way I think of it is there's often a very thin line separating a traditional and alternative investment. And so if we can kind of strip out, like, what is that one or, or more variables that make, why, why is this alternative, but this is not, I, I find a few examples. One is, is liquidity. So like, you know, the easy one here to point to is public equity versus private equity. These are both equity asset classes, but private equity very much you know, get, gets categorized as alternatives by many. And it's really just due to that illiquidity component. So that's certainly one variable that can make something, you know, uh, move from traditional to alternatives if you just take away the liquidity component. Um, I, I mentioned kind of Bitcoin earlier, but this idea of like perceived novelty, just things that people aren't generally used to using inside of their portfolio, um, you know, makes it a, a bit of an alternative. Um, old wine and new bottles is, is another theme I come across a lot where you might have Things like we'll use catastrophe reinsurance. You know, you know, for, for firms like Swiss Re have been doing that for centuries. Yeah, there's nothing new about you know reinsurance or insurance. It's the ability to access it in a investor-friendly type of vehicle that makes it alternative. Uh, because until that became an option, this is not the type of risk that people can hold on their personal balance sheet. Uh, you know, so it's I think it's like things like that where you have a new. Uh, fund structure or way to uh, access something that's been around for a while, but just hasn't been democratized for most people. Uh, un unconventional implementation might be another way to think about something like, you know, again, kind of like long, short equity. If I want to buy, you know, no one's going to, if I buy a bunch of cheap stocks, no one's going to tell me that I'm an alternative investor. If I go long cheap stocks and short expensive ones in a long, short kind of way and, and use derivatives or shorting uh, or anything or leverage or what have you, you know, if I'm using these unconventional implementation tools, that suddenly takes something that was traditional and makes it alternative. And I guess the last thing I would mention to, to kind of look at as a potential alternative variable would just be, would just be unfamiliar terrain. Um, so not so much the case today, but like things within existing asset classes that are maybe less trafficked, like emerging markets at one point, maybe frontier markets today, um, you know, still stocked, but maybe just in countries that are, are less developed. And so less people uh, allocated there. Um, yeah. And so, so a, a lot of different ways you could sort of look at, at, at a particular, you know, one or more things that might make something alternative, but there's no cut and dry definition. It's a very, you know, sort of gray line. But this is also like part of the problem, right? So in the advisor world, I think believes everything you just said. And there's, right, because they do these different methods or liquidity, but in the kind of quant world, Right, fund to funds allocated. Well, they're saying no. Like, if it has different return drivers than stocks and bonds, it's alternative, right? So, private equity, no, it's not alternative. It's still in the equity sleeve. Uh, private debt, even no, it's still in the uh, bond sleeve because it has the same return drivers, a little different flavor of it, but still the same return drivers. So, just curious, like, did you go down that path at all with the book, or how you of like, right? There's a kind of a quant answer. There's a mathematical answer, and then there's also just the practical answer that advisors don't understand it, and it's different, right? It's vanilla with caramel swirl, so they want to call that alternative, even though in my mind, hey, it's still 90% vanilla. Yeah, I mean, what one potential solution would just be, I think there's a habit of, like, from a reporting standpoint with clients is just saying, here's, here's the alternative allocation, and, you know, you may be showing the different subcategories and holdings underneath, but it could be a hodgepodge of different you know, asset classes and strategies, which, which probably doesn't do a lot of justice to um, the role that each plays inside of the portfolio. You know, a potential solution to that would be to just get a little bit more granular. So instead of having an alternatives bucket, maybe you've got a credit sleeve and a real asset sleeve and a, you know, insurance linked securities sleeve and a diversifying strategy sleeve that might include things like uh, trend following and style premium and other kind of multi-asset long short type, uh, type approaches. So, you know, getting more granular could be an option to, to, to get around that and maybe having different benchmarks for each category. Uh, but yeah, you know, th there's no right answer. I think advisors have to do what works well for them and for their clients. But you know, at the end of the day, find, you know, it's all, it's, it all becomes semantics at some point, but yeah. th those things can matter when it comes to communication. So I think as long as you're clearly, you know, uh, conveying to clients what they own, why they own it, 
what, what the role is in the portfolio, when you should expect it to do well, when you should expect it to do not so well, like those sort of things all need to come with, with the education. It sounds like you're saying as a practical matter, the clients understand the stock and bond world. There's not going to be a lot of questions there. Everything else is kind of in their mind already segmented as other, as alternative. So why not kind of leave it be and help explain and educate to them of like, okay, there's this main bucket, you know, and then there's this secondary bucket that you don't know so well. Yeah. Um, well, we'll keep, we'll keep Dooley on my side and your side trying to solve that, crack that nut. Yeah. Um, One day we'll get there. Right. Uh, and so love the one piece in the book, the periodic table of investments. Um, you kind of walk through and have a little system for what its return drivers are kind of back to what we were saying uh, and then kind of tying them together. So cash is near credit is near uh, debt securities. So uh, it seems like a useful framework. How'd you come up with that framework and how do you kind of use it on a, in practice for clients? Well, the, the framework I came up with is probably going back like five or six years. Uh, I had one of our summer interns at the time help me like kind of build, build the table in Excel, not knowing what we would do with it. I just thought like, oh, this would be a really cool visual if we had kind of the full spectrum of asset classes and sub-asset classes all in kind of one you know, periodic table looking visual. And then this idea of like within each square in the periodic table, identify for each asset what the primary and, and secondary sort of uh, uh, objectives are there. So you, things like capital appreciation or income generation or inflation sensitivity or tax efficiency or diversification or, or some sort of liquidity premium. I think those are the six that I, I use. And, and granted, this is not, you know, it's not a perfect science and I'm sure some would take, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of, of objection to how I maybe categorize things or, or what the, what the actual objective should be. But by and large, it was really just meant to illustrate um, this idea of portfolios um, are, are a combination of underlying components, much like a chemical compound is a, a combination of individual you know, chemical elements. And if you combine different elements together, you get different compounds. And similarly, if you combine different assets together, you get different portfolios. And so this idea that um, ultimately the recipe that we're trying to you know, make with the ingredients that we have should be designed to fulfill one or more objectives at the investor level. So I thought sort of that analogy of like uh, thinking of, of building a portfolio through the lens of like combining different elements together to achieve an ob objective or an outcome, uh, you know, seemed appropriate. The other idea I liked about the table was that, you know, if I think back to like when I was in, in you know, grade school or high school and they would show us the periodic table in chemistry class, like by and large, it's the, the full table, all the elements that we know and are, and are used to today. I think there's 118 documented chemical elements that sit on the periodic table. But that wasn't always the case. You know, if you go back to, I think I, I looked and did some, some Googling around this for the book, but in 1718, there was only 13 discovered, you know, elements. In 1860, there were 63. So it's like, it, I can't think, what I like is that it conveys this idea that things aren't static, things evolve over time. Uh, in the chemical world, similarly, when it comes to investments and portfolio management, we know a lot more today about building diversified portfolios than we did 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 50 years ago. Uh, our, our understanding of different return drivers and the discovery or, or implementation of new asset classes or the use of new tools has only continued to expand the, the investable universe that we have. So I thought that was a really good visual way to, to depict that. So long story short, I, I had kind of built the, the periodic table for a brochure we ended up doing in my old firm, uh, like, like an investment brochure. But as I was writing the book, I was like, oh, I kind of want to bring that concept into the book. So I think it'll help uh, illustrate this idea that I'm discussing in, in one of the chapters on just the evolution of, of asset allocation and the, and the democratization of alternatives over time. So if I was your marketing consultant, I would have said, put a, put a link in there, download this table or, or order the poster right like that would look cool in a lot of offices there, so. there, there may or may not be a poster one day i actually had a few people reach out to me about that idea so definitely well, put, it, put it up on the website say click here fill out this form give us two dollars for postage and we'll send you a poster i, I, just, um, I might need to edit it a bit just to get i need some uh some input and approval from volatility twitter on uh, <laughs> i know so i was gonna mention i was finishing up reading the book last night and i posted on my personal twitter um Love this table, love this periodic chart. 
And uh, Chris Sidio, who we know and love, said, hey, what the heck? Where's long ball? Um, so was that a conscious omission? Or I would say no, just a subconscious omission. At the end of the day, I couldn't include every single thing on there. And it probably does deserve a square of its own. So I, I, I promise Chris and others out there, if I uh, if we do an, uh, a second edition of the book, uh, I'll, I'll be sure to update the table to be more reflective of the uh, the, the more diverse nature of, uh, of volatility types of strategies. Got it. As you do have uh, VRP in there, so you kind of have the the what you call variance risk premium, which we call vol risk, but same idea of your selling vol. So yeah, there's a there's a whole world of guys out there buying that, taking the other side of that trade. Well, I, th- I, um, think I, I think I had a rel- relative value square, which is a bit vague, but you could probably interpret that as like a volatility arbitrage or some sort of relative value strategy yeah. there. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll make sure to add long ball to the next, next iteration. Um, yeah. And the, the, right. We could go off on a whole tangent. I'll send you a good piece by Ben Eifert on the, uh, right. Like adding this thing that goes down over time, the rebalancing premium and the, when it pops, when the other things don't adds a lot of value. Let's talk through some of the specific alt. So, you know, good two thirds of the book or half the book is going through alt by alt, um, what they do, how you should think about them. Uh, we mentioned private equity. I just wanted to mention like, if you, you're kind of saying in the book, you think that's going to become more and more mainstream, more available to individual investors, Vanguard's getting into the game. And so my question for you, do you think that'll be like Vanguard's actually going out and buying private companies? Probably in that scenario, but also, I know AXS has a venture capital replication mutual fund. It seems like the easier way, and probably you're not going to get that much tracking error, would be sort of these replication strategies. Yeah, I would say it depends on the investor's objectives. And you know, the, the world in 10 years in terms of access to private investments could look a lot different than it is today. So it's hard to, uh, to paint with too broad a brush. I would say, like, you know, there, I think there's going to be more, more opportunities for um, accredited investors to, to have access points to actual true private equity. We're, we're seeing a handful of those uh, today, either through vintage type, annual vintage type programs, um, or even, you know, registered um, 40 act funds, uh, typically tender offer funds that, that, that offer private market exposure. So uh, it's, it's a growing area like Vanguard's involvement. I think they're, they're partnering with HarborVest, I believe, is, is the actual, you know, manager of their strategies and they're the, the distribution of that, at least today. But yeah, again, like just to have Vanguard sort of stamp on any asset class is, is, is a bit of a, a recognition of its adoption into the mainstream. And so I think, um, you know, there's been folks like like Dan uh, Rasmussen at Bird Dad uh, has written about, hey, you can, you can kind of replicate, you know, albeit with more volatility, you can kind of replicate private equity uh, historical returns by just buying, you know, cheap, small, illiquid, you know, public stocks. Um, uh, and, and sort of gets a similar type of return profile over time. Uh, that might not be for everybody, but for those that, that place a premium on liquidity and they want to deal with the, the you know, kind of operational headaches of, of, true, of true private equity, that could be a solution. Um, Do you think that you think those worlds blend? Like the more money that comes into it, the less private it's going to be. And it'll, right, it feels like it'll be more it'll look more like public equity markets than private equity. Markets. You're, you're already seeing that sort of overlap and, and, and just the, the proliferation of crossover investors that, that play in both public and private markets. Um, I think it was just Sequoia, like maybe this past week that is kind of rethinking their whole strategy as a VC firm, where they're, instead of having a bunch of, of, you know, the fundraising cycle of a new fund every three, four years and, and having a closed, you know, finite life where they have to figure out exits for their portfolio companies. They're just, Kind of shifting to one pool of capital that will effectively be like sort of an evergreen type of structure where they don't have to uh, exit their their you know portfolio investments just because they've IPO'd and trade publicly because yeah. they think there be some significant material upside you know in public markets as well and so I think you're you know again there's just the, the growth of crossover investors um, you know not not to Take a, a public stance on um, SPAC, but just again, the interest in growth of SPACs is another just you know kind of sign of increased interest in um, from retail investors to participate in some capacity and in, in kind of private to public markets. And so I, I think you'll, you'll find more and more avenues, and I think it's going to get a little bit more you know again there could be some some 
negative externalities of that broadened access. But by and large, I think it's uh, you know a bit unfair as it's structured today that that only the you know the ultra rich can can go go into private equity and venture and most investors it's a bit off limits still. So I think that'll continue to uh, uh, to move the other direction. Uh, cool. Well, right full through these. So real estate, you sort of list as an alternative, but sort of also say like not that alternative. Um, didn't talk at all about how it may be super high valuations, right? Especially for our Canadian counterparts. But um, just talk through that quickly of like, don't most investors already have real estate? Is it really an alternative? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, yeah, mo most investors have real estate. Like, are you, are you referring to like their, their residence, like their home? Uh, yeah, or owning REITs or owning, I mean, maybe I'm in a weird spot of the people I know of, like I own these buildings and this and, you know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, th I think it's one of those, I mean, real estate is probably in, is, is older than stocks and bonds. So for, for some, it's like the original asset class. Yeah. Uh, I think for most people, their, their you know, uh, access point to, uh, real estate is through publicly traded REITs. Um, and so that, that by and large, I think if you just own like a total stock market index fund, you're getting some allocation to REITs there. So again, that, that's a very kind of, depending on who you ask, it may or may not be an alternative. I would say, you know, private real estate would definitely be more in that alternative bucket, just given the liquidity uh, involved in it. Um, and I think what you see, you know, and I mentioned this in the book is um, the growth of alternative property types has, has grown significantly and actually more so I would say in the public space than in the uh, private space. So things like, you know, cell towers and data centers that are, you know, more critical to kind of digital infrastructure are, are a huge component to publicly traded REITs today. Uh, and then you've got just a lot more breadth of other types of property sectors outside of like the core four of like, you know, multifamily and office and, and you know, industrial and retail There's self-storage and, and medical office and you know life sciences buildings and just a handful of other categories so depending on what uh sectors within real estate you might be trying to access it might nudge you one direction or the other whether you focus on public markets or private markets and i think for, for a lot of folks there could be an, an opportunity to blend the two together just you don't have to be in one camp or the other there could be you know complementary benefits to having a public and a private market um you know, real estate allocation. So I would say like the, you know, for, for clients that own a handful of buildings, maybe it's apartments that they rent out and that's kind of something that they can manage, you know, more day-to-day -day operationally like that. Yeah, that could certainly serve as a, a real estate allocation, but I, you know, not many individuals are operating, you know, data centers, <laughs> you know, so yeah, yeah. there's, again, for those, so that, that it, just because somebody has significant real estate holdings doesn't mean they shouldn't have some allocation to publicly traded REITs because there's might not be as much overlap as they think there in terms of the underlying uh, asset exposure. And when I hear publicly traded REIT, I think shopping mall, think death, right? So it's like uh, those got crushed, uh, but you're saying they've kind of morphed and now they're, I, they're I think like yeah. yeah, like I think if you looked at just like the, the broad REIT indices today, like they're Call it half or more in, 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 what, in what most would deem to be alternative like property types. So it's um, if you just start looking under the hood at like the top holdings of like the cap weighted, you know, uh, REIT ETFs, like you, you're, you'll, you'll be surprised how little there is in things like malls and, uh, and retail and, and uh, uh, you know, office and things like that. So uh, next up, sorry, I'm going fast. Uh, style premia. So uh, quickly explain, explain what that is. Um, I usually think of it more in terms of the banks giving access, but I guess you're saying a lot of individual investors can get some access. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's plenty of uh, asset managers, whether it be, you know, AQR or some of the other quant shops or even BlackRock or, you know, Vanguard might surprise people. They've got kind of style premium oriented type funds. Um, it, it, to me, that's just um, multi-asset, um, multi-factor long short type strategies that, that try to um, capture in a very sort of pure way, uh, very commonly known uh, factors and investment styles, things like value, momentum, quality, carry, you know, low volatility, um, those sorts of things. And, and not, you know, and, and doing so not just in equities, but depending on the factor you're looking at, it might be applicable in interest rate markets and credit and currencies, commodities, et cetera. And so, you know, trying to do so in a very diversified fashion, understand that there's, you know, plenty of history supporting 
both you know, data supporting their results, but also kind of economic intuitions to why these styles should work over time. And then the ability to implement it in a long, short way would just be just kind of stripping out and hedging out, hedging out that market beta and being left with kind of that pure style exposure as a diversifying asset. So um, that, that's, that's what's meant by style. Yeah, I think the, the tide went out a little bit on those in March 2020, right? A lot got smacked, a lot of investors I know are like, oh, well, someone basically needed to be managing that instead of just putting a couple of chips down on each of these things. When it all went down at the same time, there it was a uh, was an issue. But yeah, uh, I think the lesson learned there, I mean, um, would be that these these types of, of strategies, and this goes for, for a lot of other alternatives too, they're, they're not a panacea, they're not a silver bullet that's just going to make money in all markets. And so um, I think they were much like any, you know, holding in stocks or, or other asset classes. These are lot, these should be viewed as kind of long-term, if you believe in them, I mean, they should be long-term investments and not short-term trades, because, you know, if you're just viewing them, viewing them in the short run, you're going to inevitably just be disappointed at some point. So, you know, I think there's some validity to that. A lot of these discovered factors kind of post academic publication and, and as they become more widely known and, and adopted, like, you see some decay in that in that premium, but I think the the handful that do have staying power, you'll see some degradation in the in the future returns, but not enough to make them totally disappear, provided that they're supported by some sort of you know risk premium or behavioral anomaly or, or structural you know impediment that that would make it unlikely for it to go away entirely. I think what happens is you you see you know you can see some pretty bad years. But I think that is, is almost a necessary evil when it comes to these types of strategies, because if they did, if they never had a poor run, <laughs> even more money would rush in yeah. uh, and, and they would get arbitraged away a lot quicker. So I think you, you have to, you know, know, know going in uh, that you're going to you know, have some challenging times. But uh, depending on your, your confidence level and the, and the diversifying nature and the future expected return potential of some of these, like, you know, there there's, there's could be a strong case there, especially now after they've come off a, a little bit of a tough stretch. Love it. Yeah, I think, and you mentioned in the book, the Resolve paper that was kind of pointing out, like once a factor becomes known, it becomes, I don't want to say useless, but less useful as all the money floods in and kind of takes away the premium of that factor. Yeah, but then eventually sort of finds a new equilibrium it's yeah. something that, that it sort of settles around. So, you know, I think we're probably seeing some of that, you know, today, like, you know, th- those products became pretty popular for a number of years. And you know, last late year was it was a tough one. The, the year prior was a tough one. But uh, you know, if you look at most of those in, in 2021, it's actually been a pretty strong, uh, strong rebound. So again, you, you kind of have to stick with it um, to, to benefit from the eventual recovery. Love it. Um, cat bonds. So I'm not sure if you listen to my pod with Chris McCown on Vantage Risk. No, I haven't yet, but I saw that on there. So that's, that's added to my queue. I want to check that yeah, out. Yeah, I've always been super interested. I'm friends with someone in that space. And I'm just like, did did you pay out? Did this hurricane pay out? No. Did this one? No. So I was like, you guys got the best job in the world. You you sell this stuff and you never have to pay out. But uh, <laughs> he, he set me straight on how that all works. But just from an allocator standpoint, how do you how do you view those? Yeah, we view, uh, broadly speaking, like ILS, insurance linked securities, is, is one of the few kind of truly structurally uncorrelated diversifiers that exist. Um, there's not many asset classes out there like that, like like that, that have very unique return drivers that are, you know, wholly unrelated to financial markets. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're advocates of incorporating a, a portion of the portfolio to ILS-based strategies. Uh, there's a handful that are available in 40 Act format that, you know, advisors and their clients can access um, depending on the liquidity preferences. There's, you know, there's, there's a number of different types of ILS out there. There's cap bonds, which represent the more li- liquid part of the spectrum. And so you can offer that in a daily liquid mutual fund. And then there's things like quota shares that are illiquid annual contracts uh, that, that obviously you, you can't really just own a, you know, a ton of inside of a, a daily liquid. So interval funds are, are uh, generally a better or vehicle for that type of strategy. So depending on whether you wanted to emphasize cap bonds or quota shares or a blend of the two, that might influence your your product selection there, uh, but regardless, we think we think there's merit to, to the, the category inside of a portfolio. It's just again, it's not not a hedge; it's a diversifier. Like there, there's environments where you could have negative returns in stocks and negative returns in reinsurance, depending on whether you know a big catastrophic event coincides with an equity market drawdown. But 
generally speaking, it tends to be pretty diversifying in that, you know, a, a, a spike in rates or, uh, <laughs> or a recession is not going to trigger a hurt, uh, earthquake or a hurricane or something like that. And the scary thing for investors, right, is it's binary. You either make a yield or you lose the whole investment, right? Um, for the most part, it depends if they have different pieces. And Yeah, you know, it depends on the underlying portfolio construction. But yeah, it's certainly yeah. an area you want to be highly diversified in within the, the category as well. And then you handle that from your side by just uh, portfolio sizing, right? Like, yeah, we're not going to... How do we size in the portfolio and then making sure that the funds that we're going to use uh, are properly diversified internally as well? Uh, love it. And then next, real assets. So always a line item on all the endowments and pensions. But uh, sell me, if you could, on why I should use real assets instead of just a healthy dose of commodities, uh, trend-following commodities. My <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you could, you could do both. I think it boils down to investor objectives. So things like um, farmland and timberland and, and, and infrastructure, you can you can access those private asset classes through interval funds today. Um, and so that's going to be a much more kind of stable, uh, lower volatility return profile and, and a higher income component. Whereas, like you mentioned, something like um, trend following commodities might might be a nice inflation sensitive type of asset class. I, I think there's room for both in a portfolio. I think. The, the mix of those and, and the, the the preference maybe for uh, would depend on the investor and whether they can tolerate more volatility or more focused on stability and, and income. So yeah. um, I, I don't think they're mutually exclusive by any stretch, but I think just both maybe components of a larger real asset program that you know aims to, aims to deliver positive real returns uh, and have a higher degree of inflation sensitivity than stocks and bonds. Yeah. My, my issue with them, I view kind of some of those real assets, especially infrastructure as like pro-cyclical, right? Needing a strong economy where the other side it will usually do well if there's a weakening economy, a recession, et cetera. So it's a little bit like, yeah, it's, it's kind of a pro-cyclical inflation hedge. Sure. Yeah. And I think it just, again, speaks to the benefits of it. It doesn't have to be either or. There's maybe a yeah, way to yeah. put together that maybe kind of insul- insulates you a little bit there. Um, and now you had so many of these, we're trying to go through them. So I got five more. If you just do a quick sentence or two and not, uh, sure. Yeah. Sorry. I won't, I won't go too long with it. Yeah, no, I love it. There were so many good ones. I wanted to touch on most. So private credit, we touched on it briefly it used to be peer to peer lending. Like just how do you view it in general? Yeah, there's a few different areas within private credit. It could be middle market direct lending. So kind of, you know, we think of that as like a, a just a, a private version of, of non-investment grade credit. So in our view, a better alternative um, to credit than high yield bonds or, or, or syndicated loans, uh, more of a yield premium uh, and less mark to market volatility with, with stock markets. So, um, but, but beyond middle market direct funding, there is like we, what you mentioned, peer to peer marketplace lending, it's more consumer, small business focused. And then even areas like knit, you know, kind of niche credit uh, that looks to areas like litigation finance and intellectual property royalties. So there's a, a wide gamut within private debt, but there could, there could be some interesting opportunities for, for investors there. But the general idea is higher yields than you're going to get with corporate bonds or government bonds, right? Yep. Um, uh, collectibles. So does this include, we'll go, we'll talk about NFTs separately, but collectibles, we're talking comic books, gold coins or is that under gold it's anything these days i mean there's so many it's crazy the types of assets that are becoming popular within collectibles like things like you know sealed video games is becoming a popular category and trading trading cards has always been a big one uh but you know, like apps like rally and others like there's a pretty wide spectrum of collectibles out there now so this is not an area that we allocate to for clients at the moment i just think it, to me it's an interesting like this is part of a chapter i had in the book and what i view to be kind of you know, um, the future, the potential future, future investable universe, you know, things that are a bit novel today that might become a bit more mainstream as time progresses, um, but, but are, are too early stage for us to consider out for clients. But there are some cool, you know, platforms and apps out there that, if, you know, if I, I do this a little bit personally, I just, it's kind of like, I, I have a rally account. It's, it's fun to go on there and, and kind of pick different assets. Yeah. And, um, My problem so, with it is the dispersion could be. Oh, yeah, the returns are all over the place, depending on the assets. So I, I, you know, I try not to get too concentrated or it's a pretty small part of my overall portfolio, but I think it's a, it's kind of a fun hobby area. Uh, fine art. I, yeah, fine art kind well, of, man. maybe, you know, you could kind of put that side by side with collectibles, like 
not for most people, but you are starting to see the emergence of some kind of fintech platforms offering, again, not, not the ability to house the art inside of your home. You're not owning the full piece. You're, you're kind of owning a fractional share of a, of a expensive piece of artwork. But, you know, there's some history of art being a pretty, you know, good diversifier and strong returns for, for kind of blue chip art. Um, so yeah, kind of a similar area, more fintech today and more for the individual if they're interested, but, you know, a lot less a part of our, uh, our portfolios. Uh, two more shared home equity contracts. Yeah. Just kind of this idea that a lot, a lot of people are, are sort of house rich and maybe cash poor at times, or, or we just find a better use if they unlock some of the liquidity in their home equity. Uh, and so there's a few companies out there trying to facilitate this where you're selling off a portion of the upside participation in your, your, your house's appreciation and, and you get some immediate liquidity and, and that can, uh, just potentially, you know, deal, you know, Deconcentrate your balance sheet a little bit, maybe use that liquidity to for other other purposes. And so this idea that you know we finance pretty much everything else in life with the option of equity and or debt, uh, but with with homes, it's it's always been debt. So I think this is an interesting uh, new area, but, but pretty early stages. Um, and lastly, income share agreements. Yeah, kind of similarly, like as opposed to somebody financing their. Their, uh, their education through, through debt. It's almost uh, financing it through equity in themselves. Uh, and so I think particularly in some areas like uh, uh, nursing or coding and coding schools, they're, they're, it's an interesting uh, area that could see some growth as, as an alternative to the borrower to, to taking on student debt. Uh, and then from an investment standpoint, uh, it could be a potentially uh, diversifying type of uh, exposure as well. Uh, and then the infamous or famous, right, of with athletes that this is done, but that has a little bit of a politically charged of, you know, this is indentured servitude and all this stuff. So I think there's a, there's a moral hurdle to get over there as well. Certainly. Yeah. Maybe not for everybody. <laughs> um, and just talk through like, so all of these things, the goal is we, we can't get yield anywhere, right? We need yield. So all these new avenues and some of them aren't new, like you said, old wine and a new bottle, but all of them are there to, to generate the yield that's not there in normal stuff. Yeah, you know, people are looking for for yield, return potential, diversification, all the things that they've always looked for that are just harder to come by in traditional markets today. You know, what I hope, what I aim to do in that middle section part of the book, where where you get the different chapters in all the different categories, is really kind of take readers through a past, present, and future of alternatives uh, progression, and and try to make it as comprehensive as possible. So it was, yeah, by no means was it meant to be a blanket endorsement of every single category that I wrote about. It was more just kind of give give the reader the information they need to, to you know, at least make them more informed, you know, evaluate the pros and the cons, make it somewhat, you know, balanced. But um, but I think I think uh, hopefully that, that, that kind of came full circle, this idea of here, here's, here's where alternatives were, here's where they are today, here's where they may be going in the future. Yeah, just it stuck in my brain of like, would we have gotten from here to there if rates were 7%? Maybe not, right? Maybe some of these platforms never get funded, they never get off the ground because I don't need it. I'm getting I'm getting an actual savings rate at my bank. Exactly. Um, so maybe maybe that was the Fed's unintended consequences in a good way of like, hey, we've created all these jobs and and platforms uh, for people reaching for you. Um, so yeah, you I, guess I guess I guess I'll have the Fed to think if my book's a success. <laughs> exactly. Digital assets, uh, we could spend a whole nother pot on that. But just from your standpoint, like personally and as a firm, are you guys uh, recommending them? Do you put investors into them? Or are you just on top of it because it's being talked about? Yeah, I, I personally invest in crypto. Um, to date, we have yet to recommend it for clients. Um, it's, I think there's it's still a bit of a gray area. Um, we're, we're actively having conversations and exploring it. Um, with clients, you know, there, there is, you know, obviously, uh, as you would expect, when prices are doing what they're doing, you know, we get a lot of inbound questions and inquiries from clients about the space. Um, I think the, the, the challenges come from an implementation standpoint. I think there's um, some features that we don't really particularly care for in some of the like, kind of 40 act products that are out there or the ones that, that, that traded the major custodians. You know, obviously, the SEC is yet to approve a, a a spot Bitcoin or a spot Ether ETF. And so I think for, you know, d- depending on, you know, whether, whether it's tax related or, or slippage related to the underlying spot performance, I think the futures based products have some, some flaws there that, that might not make them appropriate vehicles for, for clients. 
um, the, the, you know, sort of grayscales of the world with premiums and discounts that have impacted performance materially and maybe the higher management fees like that, that can be a bit of a challenge. So I think, you know, by and large, the thinking is the, you know, if, if their if clients want to go into this category, like we need to properly arm them with education and, and have them better understand what they're getting into other than my neighbor's getting rich off this thing that seems to just do nothing but go up. Um, and at the same time, I think we want to make sure that we're not just like sending them off. Like, you know, it's one thing to say, Hey, well, if you're interested, go open, go open a Coinbase account or a Gemini account, because that's the most efficient way to get exposure because then they might, you know, go on that account and buy some Bitcoin. And then they might say, Oh, like this Shiba Inu coin is doing really well. Maybe I should own some of that. And they can go down a, a rabbit hole pretty quickly. So I think we're, we're actively interested in offering an on-ramp to clients that are interested and potentially having more visibility internally on what's going on there, maybe providing more guidance uh, around uh, allocation within the digital asset space. Um, but we're not at a point yet where we've, we've kind of drawn a line in the sand that we we do or do not advocate this in client portfolios, but I think it is um, not quite at the level that other you know strategies are at w- within our alternatives uh, sleeve where we, we think we're comfortable making a blanket uh, yes or no endorsement on behalf of all of our clients. I think it's it can be very client specific still, um, not for everybody. And I think we're just, we've yet to find comfort level and, and uh, the most efficient way to get access. So I, you know, it, it's a hot topic of conversation internally within our investment committee. We're spending a fair amount of time there, but uh, you know, time will tell what we end up doing there. And I, you know, in the book is just the latest, I've seen a lot of these of like, oh, if you put two and a half percent or 2% or 5% or whatever and rebalance, yeah. like it's always awesome. Yeah. So I'm like, well, and if it had gone, if it goes completely to zero, all you lose is the 2%. So I can see that logic, but I'm also like, what if you did that with this biotech stock or, right? Like I think back to my sports gambling days of, right? If you always do 10 team parlays, yeah. If you hit one, the return's great. If you don't, you just keep wasting 2%, you know. Day well, that's like, yeah, like you certainly wouldn't want to have half your portfolio in these sort of uh, asymmetric type bets that have, sort of, you know, more binary type outcomes. Yeah. Uh, but know, my might, point is, yeah, I don't even know if you want 2% because it adds up, right? Like over right, time. Yeah, so again, it, it's, it, dep- it, it depends on your, your strength and conviction of the, the underlying invest, investment thesis of crypto or maybe Bitcoin more specifically, depending on how you're looking at it. So yeah, you know, not, not for everybody, but it does, you know, again, it, it's, it's a limited data set. It's still a, a very nascent asset class and, you know, there's no, you can't just extrapolate what, what's happened over the last 10 years into the next 10. Like it's largely going to not look the same if we can, you know, be yeah. honest with ourselves. So, um, you know, the, the future is still uncertain there, that there could be a lot of opportunities still, but it just, we just don't have the same type of uh, uh, historical evidence that we can examine with other asset classes. Agreed. Um, so along those standpoints, end the book with some portfolio construction ideas. Um the one I latched onto is the 10, 10, was it? Or um, it was really 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Yeah, look at that, that. I borrowed that from, from Ross Stevens. He's the CEO of, of Stone Ridge uh, Asset Management. And that's really just kind of a simple framework. It's not necessarily like what we do or what someone has to do. It's just like if you're kind of, if you're new to alternatives and you're trying to figure out like, okay, like we've now reviewed like 20 different, however many yeah. alternative investments throughout this book. Like, how do I make sense of all this? Like, right, and that's my problem of like, I like it all. How do I do it all? And that's where the challenges can lie in that it's, you can get really too cute too quickly in terms of trying to like optimize. But at the end of the day, if you're saying I'm going to introduce 10% or 15% or 20% of the portfolio uh, to alternatives broadly, you know, at the end of the day, like the, the, whether you do, do 2% here or 3% to this one, like, it's going to matter less if you're trying if you're trying to incorporate a pretty broad swath of, of, of alternatives. It's hard to argue with something simple like an equal weighted approach. Um, not to say that's the right answer. It's just at least from a from a framework way of thinking like, hey, I want to I want to find ways to improve the diversification of my portfolio. Whether I do ten percent, twenty percent, or thirty percent, let me just think about the the alternative separately for a minute, and just think of this idea of like. There's, there's power to having diversifying uh, components in there. So let's just try to collect 10 different risk premiums, each sort of intuitive, each that can deliver different types of return streams. And let me just, you know, equal weight them with yeah. an alternative bucket. So that, that's one way to do it. It's not necessarily the right way. It was just kind of one of, one of the hands. 
50 of them at 2%, right? Is there some lower bound where like, okay, this, it's not a meaningful exposure. Well, that's right? kind of the idea, idea is like start to go beyond 10 and maybe you're starting to get, you know, a little too thin and not, not material enough. Um, you know, maybe it, it, it's sort of a, a it's just the idea of like maybe not putting all your eggs in one or two different categories, but spreading it out a little bit more. Um, so I think it's a helpful framework to get somebody started that, that maybe isn't in the weeds quite yet, but um, you know, there's certainly other approaches you could adopt as well. And what say I'm like, I want to invest in everything in the book. What what's my account size got to be? Right, like some of these, even though they're available to individual investors, it might be at a million dollar minimum or a um, right. So, do you have any thoughts on what that account size would look like? It's tough because I mean, I mean, I we wouldn't even necessarily recommend that you know someone do everything in the book. Yeah, I think you know depending on whether you're a qualified purchaser or an accredited investor, that you know if you're under those requirement levels, that might limit your universe of, of opportunities at least today. So things like hedge funds and private real estate and private equity might be off off the table for you. Um, there's, I would say, for the kind of bulk of the the chapters in, in section two of the book, things like alternative risk premia, um, alternative credit. Um, real assets, insurance and securities, you know, by and large, you can implement that today with 40 Act, you know, mutual funds and interval funds. Um, and so those don't have accredited investor part requirements. So um, you, you don't have, you know, the portfolios of most sizes could, could accommodate most or all of those uh, kind of core alternatives there. Yeah. And then I have to mention on behalf of all my long ball friends that they probably a view, especially that pie of 10% in each was in my mind, like 90% offense, 10% defense with the 10% defense being managed futures, which isn't even necessarily always defense. But well, I, think of, I've seen, I think I've seen from Chris Cole at Artemis, he's got that just basically like everything's like, instead of there being like dozens of asset classes, everything's either short ball or long ball. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I think that would, I think that would make for a pretty boring periodic table if I just had <laughs> short, short, short ball and long ball, but uh right. But the investors, like I'm, I'm right. At the end of the day, they might need some of that long run. They need something that's going to do well when all those other, no matter, you know, because it's vanilla caramel swirl, vanilla with chocolate chips, vanilla with this, right? There, if they all melt at the same time, you need that defensive piece. Yeah, I think trend following can be a, a, a good component there. I think something like insurance and securities, like it's not a hedge. It's not something you're gonna like bank on. It's going to do well when equities are doing poorly. Yeah. I think it because it's uncorrelated enough that that you know it it, it could be doing quite well. Um, and I think too, like what, what we're advocating in the book is not this idea of just get rid of the forty altogether from a sixty forty. It's it's sort of just like let's de-emphasize it. But you know, at the end of the day, if we if there's a you know depression type scenario or a huge deflationary type you know environment, that you know could still be in an area where high quality fixed income and treasuries. Uh, you know, do quite well. So we, we still want to own some, maybe not perhaps as much as we're, you know, used to owning in, in, in prior decades. I love it. Um, and then last bit, the last chapter, you talk a bit about the advisor's struggles with all this, right? And what you mentioned before of the, I, I had the wrong numbers, but you're saying 80% of his time on 20% of the allocation. Yeah, um, I mean, it's just my, you know, uh, no, but I've run into that before. And we, we've actually sold alts before. Like, hey, let us, RCM, help you, right? You don't need to spend 80% of your time on this. We'll help educate the clients for that 20, you know, 10, 20%. But just doesn't, doesn't that part need to come first? Like before yeah, you start investing all this, you need to fix the advisor part where they can educate yeah, the clients. It, it, it's, it definitely has to come first, which is funny because it's the last chapter in the book. But I think yes. the reason I, yeah, made I didn't mean that kind of first, but just, yeah, in, pre, in well, the real world. I, I think the reason I placed it there, I thought it was like a, a, an appropriate closing note for the book to talk about communication techniques for clients. Because at the end of the day, regard, if you've read the entire book up to that point and you buy into everything that I've said, it's kind of all for nothing. If, if you're not equipped with the confidence uh, to be conversant in these strategies and to get your clients comfortable with them um, and, and able to stick with them for the long run, um, otherwise it's all for nothing. So I think it's, it's, it's the only way really to close out because that's the, the final necessary step to make you an effective allocator using alternatives is you've got to have this ability to, you know, simplify the complex, to make the unfamiliar familiar, uh, and to sort of translate these concepts and ideas in a way that your end client can understand and interpret and, and get on board with. So I think, you know, that was really the focus of trying to tie, tie a bow on things there was 
you know, we understand why 6040 has been a security blanket for, uh, for investors and for advisors. And we know why it's been so difficult to, to, to get off of that. Let's, let's evaluate some different ways you can try to communicate uh, these strategies so that you can, you know, get out there and feel comfortable making it. I love it. Um, and lastly, where, where can they get the book? Where can they find you? Sure. Yeah. So the, the release date for the book is uh, November 30th. So just under a month from now. Uh, you know, Amazon is, is primarily where most people, I assume, are going to order from. It's on Barnes & Noble, too, if you happen to, to shop there. Um, happy to uh, entertain. I know if there's an interest in a bulk order for any reason, uh, we can talk directly and work with my publisher uh, there. Um, you can find me online at, at, on Twitter at Bips and Pieces. Uh, BPS and Pieces is, is my handle. Uh, it's also the name of my blog, bipsandpieces.com. Uh, our firm is Savant Wealth Management, and our website is savantwealth.com. Um, so generally, that's that's where you can find yep. me. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, I, I keep my uh, my DMs open if you have any questions. But yeah, just uh, very much look forward to the book coming out here soon and, and hope you all uh, enjoy it. Awesome. And we'll put all that in the show notes of where they can get all that good stuff, too. So we finish up all the pods with some personal favorites quick rapid fire you ready all right let's do it uh favorite professional wrestler favorite all time sean michaels favorite currently brian danielson well i know neither of those guys what were their <laughs> what were their screen names or their stage names uh, that was so sean michaels was the heartbreak kid sean michaels that was his screen name brian danielson you might have known him as daniel bryan he was the yes guy oh yeah the yes chance, but anyway, so he's at a different company now, so he's got to go by his real name instead of the WWE name. So his real name happens to be Brian Danielson. Uh, You're yeah. too young to probably remember. Uh, I think his name was Terry Taylor, the Rooster. The oh no, I, no, I remember the, the Red Rooster. Yeah. He he went to Vero Beach High School in my hometown, Vero Beach. So he's my favorite. Um, <laughs> and then of course Hulk Hogan. You got to like Hulk and Superfly. Suka was one of my favorites. I, mean, I, I grew up, you know, kind of in the 80s era and early 90s era of pro wrestling. So that always holds a, a soft spot for me. Um, favorite quote in the book. You have all these. Every chapter begins with some great quotes. It was it like a labor of love to pull all those or you had those in a notebook your whole life. Oh, the, the intro uh, yeah. um, quotes. Man, I don't know if I have a favorite, but I will say that was one of the more fun aspects of the book was like trying to find quotes that were relevant like the, each chapter starts with with two or three quotes and my goal was to make them sort of implicitly about investing and, and the topic of the chapter but not explicitly yeah and so it was it was kind of fun to search around and dig for those and i thought there was a few a few good clever ones in there so w- without spoiling it much hopefully that's a nice uh, easter egg for the potential readers for sure so you don't have a favorite you have a favorite that didn't make it in the book uh, I, maybe my favorite was um, for chapter two, which is about this, I, the whole chapter is about alternatives being a loaded word. Um, it was that, that, that quote from the princess bride, which is uh, yeah. that word. It, it doesn't mean what I think you think what it means. Yeah. Something like that. Anigo Montoya. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, favorite investing book. that's not your own. No. Uh, I've actually written a blog post on this, my favorite investing book. And it's, it's a very, it's not necessarily a book for novices, but it's, uh, expected returns by uh, Auntie Ilmanen, who uh, now works at AQR, pre- was previously at Brevin Howard, I think, when he wrote it. Um, just a, a very thick, you know, dense yeah. textbook on, on, on asset allocation and portfolio instruction and alternatives. It was very much a, a um, deep dive uh, to me on a lot of the things that I, I, you know, just found very interesting. And so I think more than any other book, it kind of changed my thinking about what goes into building thoughtful, well-diversified portfolios that are built for the long term. So um, that, you know, that book has very much influenced me and um, not necessarily I would, something I would call beach reading or something I would, I would share with like end clients or, or, or yeah. uh, retail investors, but for professional allocators, I, it's hard to think of something better than that. Uh, favorite Chicago pizza place. And I would say, I mean, we're, we've been in the birds for a few, few years now. And so our, our pizza selection is not as great, but back to my, uh, my city days, I would say, you know, uh, whether it's Bacchanopoly and Peace and Peace, Pequods, those are all a few that I, I liked over the years. But in terms of what we're getting now, if we're just getting delivery of the house, uh, hard to go wrong with thin crust uh, Lumos. 
Loom on that. It's got it. Um, yeah, Pequod's is the only right answer. Although I think they've changed owner. Someone said it's not as good these days. Um, and lastly, favorite Star Wars character. Oh man, you're gonna <laughs> kill me here. So as much of a, a nerd I am with uh, professional wrestling, I have to admit I've actually never seen a Star Wars movie. Never before. one, but surely you know some of the characters. Yeah, so I guess I can just I'll go Han Solo because I don't know yeah. anything. About there you go. <laughs> He's cool. He gets the job done. Yeah. Um, awesome. I, so, I use I use my entire nerd allotment on wrestling. I, I didn't have any right. nerd uh, room left over for any other you know hobbies. And then did it like morph into MMA or you're sticking with uh, pretty, pretty, pretty disciplined. Got it. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, Phil. It's been fun. Um, we'll look you up next time we're on North Shore there and grab a, a coffee or something and looking forward to seeing the book come out. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeff. I appreciate you having me on. It's been a ton of fun. Thank you. Awesome. The Derivative is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures and options, visit cmegroup.com. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at RCMAlt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalts.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.